Hey everyone, this is Vicki Connor. And I'm Jamie Hale. You know, we're getting closer to 2024 and looking forward to another year of Pacific Northwest travel. And as we make our travel plans, we want to know all about the places that you want to see and all the things that you want to do. If you have any fun travel plans or questions about places to travel, let us know. On our upcoming New Year's episode, we'll be covering all of your great ideas as well as some travel ideas of our own. You can email your travel plans, dreams, and questions to podcasts at oregonian.com. But for now, on to this week's episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by the Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Vicki Connor. Together, we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today, we're headed to the Central Oregon coast to go searching for some hidden treasure. That's right. And if your mind is going to like the Goonies, just like reel it in a little bit. We're not talking about like secret caches of gold doubloons, but rather beautiful glass floats that can be found hidden around the beaches of Lincoln City. The glass floats are part of a program called Finders Keepers, which commissions work from local glass blowers and tasks volunteers or float fairies with hiding them at various places around the local beaches. And what started as a fun event has blossomed into a hugely popular phenomenon on the Oregon coast. Yeah, and here to tell us all about these hidden glass floats is Stephanie Hull, the event and outreach coordinator for Explore Lincoln City, which is the organization in charge of Finders Keepers. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you both for having me. Yeah, well, this is, you know, obviously a really popular program. It is, to be clear, one of the the most popular stories I write every single year. It's one of the best read um, pieces I, I I I do so this is something that people are very invested in that obviously has turned into this huge thing so I guess why don't we just start with like when and how did Finders Keepers begin? So it actually began um, with a local artist that wanted to find a way to celebrate the new millennium and while looking at the coastline, thought about Japanese fishing floats that will come up on shore and has done that for decades and thought, what if we crafted glass floats locally made for people to find to ring in the new millennium? So it started in the fall of 1999 through the year 2000. And Explore Lincoln City sponsored that first inaugural drop, and then we've taken over it throughout the years. I love that, like, everyone was worried about Y2K, and it was a kind of a stressful new year. <laughs> I remember that. Um, but instead, Lincoln City's like, let's make some nice glass floats and hide it for people. What a great way to do the new year. Yeah. And actually, the first round or so um, had artists throwing them actually into the ocean. And we, we no longer do that, obviously. <laughs> um, that was the first go around there. And so uh, now they're definitely not hidden below the high tide lane or up an embankment. Um, we want to protect the environment and those that want to go seeking that treasure. Well, uh, for me, as kind of an Oregon newbie, or at least within the past three years, I'm not too familiar with this. So Stephanie, can you explain how this works? Yes. So as you guys mentioned before, we have um, several studios local throughout Oregon, majority within the coast that create these finders keepers floats. And they are actually signaturely hand stamped with the Finders Keepers logo and the year on it. And then they're personally etched by those artists with their signature on them. And we have volunteers called float fairies that anonymously drop these floats throughout Lincoln City beaches. And they're dropped anytime in daylight hours. There's no specific set time or day. The only time that they're not dropped is obviously inclement weather, king tides, that kind of thing, because we want everybody and the glass to be safe. And if you're lucky enough to find a float, we ask that you register them. And by doing that, 
uh, you'll get a bio of the artist that created your float as well as a certificate of authenticity and a little mini postcard of this year's poster included, which is such a fun treat. Wow, that's so cool. And for folks who, who may not know like what a glass float is, um, mm -hmm. what can, can you describe what this looks like? What are we talking about? Yeah, so the artists actually handcraft them, um, glass coming together in heat, and they actually blow them into the shape of almost a circle or an orb. And it's actually quite a process um, because then once they're formed, they have to be put and cooled slowly over time within 24 hours um, to make sure that they don't shatter. And so it, it takes quite a few um attempts and everything else to kind of get that that strategy right um and so then once like i said once they're crafted they're shipped or dropped off to us and our float fairies kind of take it from there as yeah, so we're talking about glass orbs that are mm -hmm. usually colored that are roughly how big are we talking about um we try to get them roughly i believe four to six to eight inches. They're not, we're actually pretty specific. We don't want them too small or too large because um, as floats get larger, they can also potentially get thinner or you don't want them so heavy that they're like a bowling ball. You know, we want people to be able to carry them. Um, so there's kind of specific requirements around, around those guidelines for our artists. And Stephanie, I know you mentioned artists would throw them into the water, and now that is no longer the case. Has um, has this event evolved in any other ways throughout the years? In some ways, I would say our we have special drops throughout the year that um, you know coincide with different holidays. Like for example, Fourth of July, we'll have a red, white, and blue drop. Um, during college football, those two schools that we have here, there might be colored ones based on those two colleges, um, things like that, that kind of go throughout the year. We have a wonderful partnership with Shinnequins Casino Resort, and we do a drop for their anniversary every year. And we also do one for um, Celebration of Honor, which honors veterans. And so we also partner with them with that celebration as well. And these special drops, so normally when a float ferry is going out, like on any given day, they, they're, they're putting like one float on some beach somewhere. Is that right? Not necessarily one float. It varies. We actually have them drop roughly 3,000 a year. Um, so it staggers and some are dropped every day um, throughout. And then those special drops are on top of it. They're themed. So, for example, we have a kite festival. Those drops will happen within those two days of that festival um, or a specific holiday weekend. So that would be kind of an extra added drop throughout the year. It, it seems like if you want to find a glass float and you want to have like better odds, these special drops where you have just looking at your calendar, you know, upwards of 50, 100, 200 floats over the course of a week or a few weeks, those seem like a better time to go if you're like want, want to, you know, up your chances of finding something. Is that right? Potentially, or if there's just a specific theme that you're looking for gotcha. that might go with your house or something that's <laughs> meaningful, that could be a fun, a fun time to go and look as well. And it used to be in the off season. So it used to be after Labor Day and then it would end right before Memorial Weekend. And on our 20th anniversary, it was decided that let's do year round. And so um, since the late 2019, that's when um, it's been year round, which is great. So I imagine, you know, with, with all the hype that Jamie's been talking about and his stories about this, there are people who are really, really into this. Um, are there people who are just like major collectors of these floats, like know the tips and tricks to getting these? <laughs> We ask that it's one float per household per year. We want to share the love and we want to make sure that as many people as possible can get a piece of Lincoln City to take home with them. Um, but there are definitely families that have gone out and searched and generations have gone out and searched. Um, and then there's just some great moments that have happened where um, someone was um, had just lost a loved one and was kind of just at peace thinking about that person and happened to look down at her feet and there was a float. In oh, that wow. moment. So this is just really unique, beautiful wow. stories that we get to hear, which is so fun. And I think in 2005 or six, um, we got a call from London, England, and a float had somehow gone through the ocean. And we actually 
talk to Noah and there's two theories. One is that a whale picked it up and eventually it found its way to England or the tides like El Nino eventually got it to England, which is such a unique story. That's only happened once, but still what a cool story. That's, that's insane. <laughs> to me. Yes. I love the idea of a whale, like just coming across a float and being like, I'm going to carry this. Yeah. across the world I, I, little mini art collector for us right yeah. like just like i feel like that could be like a child's book or something like the lore of finders keepers you know oh my gosh definitely the original float fairy a whale that would be great <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is i mean i know that like you know this people like like vicky was saying people get up into this and like you were saying the generations households does this get like competitive ever or do people have you had to like try to like tamp tamp it down a little bit at all oh i'm sure it does get competitive on the beaches where people are just scouring and looking and uh one of the best tips that we give out because so many people are just like zero in and focused on trying to get that piece that we say just relax enjoy the scenery take a walk you know go in with nature and then you might happen upon it and I almost equate it like you know when you lose your car keys and you're just frantic and you just keep looking but they're right in front of you the whole time it's kind of like that but on a larger scale where you're like okay just sit back take a breath like and you might just happen upon it it's it's mostly like people walking along the shore and they just mm -hmm. happen. To, it's not people being like, oh, look out in the water, like swimming out to get things or anything. Like that. No, no, no. We definitely discourage that. And like I said, okay. we don't drop in the water. So we, yeah. we don't we don't want people to um, injure themselves. So no. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. It's it's sort of within the, the, the high, it's above the high tide line. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's above the high tide line and then it's below embankment. So you don't have to climb up rocks or anything and disturb the environment. Um, and a lot of times it'll be, you know, you head down a beach access point and it can kind of be go through that, decide to go left or right and just walk along the beach. And it might be kind of around, you know, maybe seagrass or near um, a uh, driftwood, something like that, you know, but it won't be hidden where it would cause damage. How many float fairies are there? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> genuinely. That's like, um, we have a couple coworkers that work with them. And I don't even know combined if they know. That's part of the fun of the mystery for all of us is that I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That, that secretive element of this is captivating to me. I know that we've, at the Oregonian, tried to do like stories with you all like can we go out with a float fairy can we do some video and you all have told us like straight up no <laughs> like, yeah we, we gatekeep that hard <laughs> 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 yeah the reason why float fairies can't necessarily go on tour or go with a journalist is because it would disrupt their anonymity and they wouldn't be allowed to drop anymore so that's kind of the hard one but we can always one of our staff can definitely go out and you know, kind of do a mini drop and show you how it's done. So we can, we can kind of go around that. Gotcha. There, there's an implication here though, that like, um, people are like, you know, looking around for float fairies and it's like, if they're found out, then someone's going to be like, okay, I'm going to watch for them to walk their dog on the beach and like see where they're going to drop a float, which is insane to me. And also so mm -hmm. cool that people take this so seriously. Oh, we totally have a naughty list where we're like, look out for these people, uh, like float fairies, <laughs> like <laughs> they're, they're coming for you. Like, yeah. So we, we have all different kinds of methods of trying to, to track, to make sure that they keep their anonymity. Oh my gosh. So what do you think that finders keepers brings to Lincoln city? I think it's a beautiful partnership where art meets the outdoors and it's supporting local artists and bringing attention to their shops and their studios. And I just think it's just that beautiful combination of being one with nature and getting out there and collecting art. And the really cool thing is what we try to tell people, it's like, okay, if you, if you don't end up finding one, you can go to one of these shops and you can hand blow a float with an artist and make it special in another way. So we're really trying to kind of connect people with the artists that create them. Do you have any thoughts as to why this has become so popular to the degree that it is now? That's a great question. I just feel like 
kind of what you said in your intro. It's part like Goonies treasure hunt right here on the Oregon coast, part art collection. And and I think the name is just brilliant. Finders keepers where, you know, you actually get to take something and find it and, and keep it and it's yours. And, or maybe you give it as a gift to a loved one. And it's just the, the storytelling and the meaning behind it. I think Lincoln city is this great place where, like I said, generations kind of come back year after year and make memories and to keep something so unique as a memory for years to come and talk about your experiences is just lovely. And I feel like that's really kind of the root behind why so many people love the program. That's awesome. And I I love that so many people are so into this, but I can't help but imagine like if you were just to not know about this and to happen upon one of these glass orbs, like how special that moment would be. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you have people like, what is this? What, you know, they find it there. We don't, and they'll come up to our welcome center and kind of question it. And we go through the whole program. We're like, this is so neat, you know? Um, And we also have a couple side programs as well. So we have uh, what's known as Trash for Treasures. So we encourage people to go out and pick up trash on the coastline, send a picture of your bag full of trash and be entered into a monthly drawing for a float. And um, if you are disabled, unable to to comb the beaches, we also have an ADA um, drawing monthly as well, where come visit us at the visitor center, we will uh, register you for a monthly drawing as well, because we want everybody to be able to participate. And we love that people want to take care of our beaches too. So those are other two side programs with Finders Keepers that have grown through the years, which are super important. I, I love that advice that you all give about finding these too, of just, you know, don't think too much about it. Just enjoy a day in the beach. I feel that's, that's why I tell people about finding anything else in the beach, whether it's like whole sand dollars or like agates or fossils, mm-hmm. you know, if you just enjoy your walk, like I, I, I find this all the time. If I go looking for a, a whole sand dollar, I can never find one. But as soon as I'm just like forgetting about it, just going about my day, enjoying the beach, I just stop and look down and there's like three at my feet. And it seems like there's something about taking that mindless approach. There's something like really meditative. Um, And like, I don't know, I feel like that's, that's the kind of thing you can apply to like general life. So it's like finders keepers is this great way to practice this mindfulness that Mm -hmm. you can apply to everything. That's a great point. Yeah. That's well said. Well, do you, have you thought about expanding this, about doing something different, other kinds of art on the beaches, other kinds of things, or is it just like the, the floats are so popular you want to keep doing these? At one point, and I'm not sure for how many years, um, we did different um, art pieces with like little glass shells, glass starfish, that kind of thing. And everybody was like, okay, yeah, that's great. Where's my float? <laughs> because the floats were so popular. Like, I don't, I don't want the crab. I want, I want the float. And so uh, we kind of come around full circle where it's like, no pun intended, obviously no full circle, but we decided that the floats are definitely uh, the most popular. So, um, and it's one of those things where it's like, if it's not broke, you know, why fix it? It's obviously give the people what they want, you know? <laughs> Man, I would love to find a glass crab on the beach. That sounds so cool. <laughs> right? Man. Well, um, you mentioned the the special drops, and mm-hmm. it looks like the schedule for the special drops is now released for 2024. Are there yes. any in particular that you're really looking forward to? There's one in a week or so that um, is red and black for a specific sports team that might play basketball in Portland. <laughs> and they are so cool. They are incredible. Um, They're just kind of black with like red speckles. They're so unique and textured. Um, So that's a really cool one. And then I know to kick off, we're going to have really, I think some colorful glass coming in for New Year's Eve, and that'll be our 2024 kickoff. Um, And I'm not sure in October what the plans are. I know this last year we had glow in the dark floats where the glass and it looked like waves that were etched and they glow, they glow yellow, neon yellow in the dark. <laughs> um, and so I'm hopeful that we'll get something like that again. And if not, I'm sure we'll, we'll come up with something with the artist that is great, but what a fun, different, unique float to get. Wow. So cool. That's so cool. Um, I, I am curious. I've, I've heard you mention 
um, sports teams, not by name. Mm-hmm. Is there is there a reason that are you like is there like some sort of you know copyright issue? You're not allowed to sort of name the teams. I'm not sure, and I just don't want to go there in case there is. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, well, red and black floats very cool um, for our local uh, Oregon basketball team. Um, yes. So and you mentioned that that opening um, weekend float, that's what, December 30th to January 1st? Is that right? I believe so, yes. We can yeah. double check that, but I know it's it's through New Year's Eve weekend. So that will be sort of the first special drop of this new year. Of the season, of yeah. the new year, yeah. Yeah, and obviously lots of other opportunities for people to find these special drops. There you know, are, oh, I want to say, almost monthly throughout the year. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely um, monthly drops, if not every other month. And there's some unique ones like Valentine's Day, you'll see kind of, you know, pinks or reds and just kind of going with like the season. And we have Antique Week where we partner with antique shops in February. And um, we have antique style floats where they're either crafted like their antique Japanese floats or some might actually be we have a couple collectors that we've purchased those from um, and we drop I think a hundred if not 200 I believe a hundred that week so it's a chance to get um, potentially a piece of history which is great that is so so cool Um, Well, Stephanie, any other tips or advice for people who uh, go to Lincoln City for the first time and want to want to find a float? Yeah. So the whole range of beach, all seven miles of sand starts in Rhodes End, goes down to Silette's Bay. And that's the range um, of where the floats are dropped. And like I said, there's no specific time or you know, part of the day that they'll drop. The only thing is they are dropped in daylight hours. Um, So if you're out there at three in the morning with a flashlight, they're, they're not going to be dropping out there. So recommend coming down on the beach in daylight hours. And like I said, just kind of enjoy the beach walk, take a bomb, you know, beach bonfire when it's uh, safety, you know, available and just kind of, you can kind of maybe look towards the sun and see if something is kind of sparkling down with a ray. You can kind of look for some, you know, reflection, that kind of thing is a good tip that we like to say. But like I said, kind of what we talked about before, the main thing is just kind of, you know, don't panic (laughs) 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 and, and just enjoy the, enjoy the walk, enjoy the surroundings. The nice thing too, is that if you don't find a float, there's going to be more floats. Um, exactly. Always a nice exactly. excuse to stop by Lincoln City, take a walk on the beach, maybe find a float. You know, mm-hmm. the, the fact that you've been doing this for, you know, over two decades now um, mm-hmm. is, is, I mean, it's very impressive. And it's, um, I think, really nice for folks to know, like, yeah, this is, this is a reliable treasure hunt you can continue to do. It's not a one time only thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's year round. Like you said, it's been going on for over two decades and over 3000 floats are dropped a year. So there's chances that people will definitely find them, which is just great. We want people to have fun and experience it and hopefully come away with something handcrafted and awesome. What a special Oregon tradition. I really (laughs) love this. (laughs) Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for, for, for helping these floats come to be and helping folks have fun on the beach. And thanks for coming on here today to tell us all about it. You're welcome. If you guys happen to find one, you better come see me and show me. Oh, definitely. I, I'm going to go look. Next time I'm out on the coast, I'm going to go take a look. Well, folks, that'll do it for today. Until next time, you can watch our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel and view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel as well as hereisoregon.com. Please leave us a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast, as well as our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details at oregonlive.com slash pod support. Also, if you're a fan of the show and you're interested in potentially sponsoring it, you can get in touch with our marketing people at advertise at oregonian.com. This episode of the show was produced by me, Vicki Connor, alongside Jamie Hale. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 Seconds of Zen.